and welcome to the Allocators Podcast, where we go inside the minds of financial decision makers and their allocation priorities for 2023 and beyond. I'm your host, Cher Ross. And today, I'm joined by Howard Goldman, Chief Financial Officer of D.D. Hirsch Mental Health Services. Thanks for joining us, Howard. It's great to have you here. Before we start, can you share some background on your role and your experience in finance? Yeah, I am uh, currently the, the CFO of D.D. Hirsch Mental Health Services, which is a uh, community-based mental health organization that also operates the largest mental health crisis and suicide lifeline in the country. My previous to joining D.D. Hirsch in 2015, my career was in the for-profit world, working uh, a combination of seated roles and consulting I spent a lot of my career in consulting, so in and out of a lot of different companies and a lot of different industries. For the last seven and a half years, I've been working with D.D. Hirsch, um, mostly funded by county, L.A. County and state funding. Interesting. So as, as something that's been funded by the government, what's, what's really the parameters of how you think about capital allocation in your day to day? Well, it's interesting because until very recently, we had very little excess cash. We, uh, our contracts are mostly cost reimbursement. And the way the government contracts work on cost reimbursement, they'll pay your costs up to a point and and never any more than your costs. So we had no opportunity to earn a surplus, but we did take the financial risk of of a potential deficit. So... I was more concerned with cash management than capital deployment. Um, In the last six months, that's changed quite dramatically. We got a very large donation from one donor that was unrestricted, meaning we can use it for operations, whatever we want. Uh, We also got caught up on some old accounts receivable from the county. And that's now put us in the position of having capital and the opportunity to use that to develop new lines of business. Anything kind of interesting now in terms of new lines of business that the team's looking at right now, or is it still pretty early? The huge growth for us is in the crisis area. The federal government introduced a three-digit number for uh, crisis lines. Previously, there was a suicide crisis line network called the National Lifeline, and centers had to qualify to be part of that lifeline, but it was a central 800 number where the calls were distributed based on the area code of the caller. The government decided no one could remember the 800 number, so by default, a lot of people call 911 or don't call anybody. So 988 was intru- introduced in July of 2022. It also shifted because it the federal government put the onus on states to implement it. So prior to 988, California had 13 call centers that were part of the Lifeline network, but they were all independent. And then they became California's network. And uh, the government, essential, or the state, essentially selected D.D. Hirsch to lead that effort. We answer about 40% of the calls in California, and we are the largest nationwide. So we've been put in that leadership role. And... You know, that's a huge growth area for us. So as a spinoff from that, given our expertise in crisis, we, we have a crisis counseling business that we're really trying to grow. Most of our other services are for the medical population, but these cri- the crisis line, anybody can call. Have, have you seen an uptick in activity since COVID? Like how did, how did COVID impact your business? COVID didn't really, I don't think, impact the crisis line that much. I mean, when, when 988 was introduced, for the first few days, we had a doubling of calls. Well, I think people just tested it. But that settled down to about a 20 or 25% increase. So I think just people knowing the number, it hasn't really been promoted that strongly because a lot of states are really not well prepared for a, for a large growth in the number of calls. California is probably ahead of most, and and D.D. Hirsch is probably the most prepared. So the counseling center that we have is really designed to be able to serve anybody who's in crisis, whether they're Medi-Cal or not. Well, probably not Medi-Cal. We put the Medi-Cal clients back into our other contracts. But this is so that we can serve people who are not on Medi-Cal. You know, we're starting to build uh, relationships with commercial insurance companies, 
but it's a startup business for us. So, you know, we are seeing probably a deficit this year as we build that business. So just with that in mind, what's what's keeping you up at night right now? You know, not much keeps me up at night from work. I, I'm able to, to separate that out. It's interesting that uh, being in the position of having some some cash in the bank, and in fact, under this program with the state, we also just got a very large amount of cash that we'll be distributing out to other call centers. Um, and that's coincided with the Silicon Valley Bank crisis. We happen to bank with First Republic, who've been a a great bank for us, but are getting a lot of bad press right now. So one of the things I'm scrambling for this week is to make sure that all our funds are secure and not exposed to being uninsured. And how are you doing that? Just because I think it's a, obviously it's a topical you know, theme right now is just thinking about all these regional banks. Well, again, the timing is interesting. As I say, we yeah. recently found ourselves with this excess money and, and with the well, I'm saying in the past, we, we didn't have a lot of excess funds and, and interest rates were so low that we weren't really too concerned about, you know, investing the little bit of excess when we did have it. But with rates going up and having money in the bank, we'd already talked to the bank of setting up a self-directed brokerage account where we could invest in treasuries and ladder those treasuries so that funds would come available as needed. And they been dragging their feet a little bit on setting that up. And finally, middle of last week, I started to get the, the paperwork on that. I think when everything happened on, on you know, Thursday and Friday with Silicon Valley Bank, they were inundated and I wasn't getting that account in place. So I talked to my banker and as a short-term measure, we're using an insured sweep account so that the bank will sweep all our excess funds every night and they get distributed around other banks with no account over $250,000. So we, as a short-term measure, we're putting everything into smaller accounts. And probably later today, I'll be talking to another institution about setting up an account for us to buy treasuries. And at this point, we're you know, we're following a very conservative investment path. We've, we've not really had funds in the past, so we don't have an investment policy, but, you know, we'll go into laddered treasuries for the time being until the dust settles. Yeah. I mean, it's obviously uh, a lot of events happening right now in the banking world, right? <laughs> Interesting. Okay. What what kind of indicators in the market are you looking at right now? Like, obviously, interest is, is one that, that there's constantly, you know, discussions around whether it's going up. If you had a crystal ball, where, 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 do, you, where do you think also interest, interest rates are going next year? I, I think they're going to stay pretty close to where they are. You know, I think if inflation slows down, the Fed may slow down it, its increase in the rates, but I don't see them going down very much. And like I say, we're, we're fortunate in that we're, we're not really a borrower. I mean, we have one outstanding loan that we took out when we purchased the property. And, and we were able to do something that everybody could do. We were able to get a tax-free loan uh, by issuing a bond we're able to get a loan where the the bank doesn't pay tax on the interest it pays us, so they discount the rate. So, you know, we have a 10-year loan that's under 3%. And is that because you're a nonprofit that, that there's some rules around that? Or, okay. Yeah. Yeah, we were able to do this bond issue, and then essentially the bank takes the whole bond issue and becomes a lender. Very interesting. Do you see do you see the business heading next year with with kind of the surplus continuing? Like is donations becoming a more thoughtful strategy for for the for the business? I think so. I think we're um, you know we've had some changes in the last couple of years at the our CEO level that have been interesting. We had one CEO who came in really with the brief to diversify our revenue streams, but he didn't really get connected to the existing business. We now have a CEO who's been with the agency 20 years, and I think we're, we're back to sort of focusing on, you know, what is the core mission of the agency, but how can we expand that? And with a lot of payment reform in the state on um, the services that we provide, and I think building our, building our reputation, uh, as I said, I think we're... We're pretty well known in 
LA County and California circles as a mental health provider, but this leadership role in 988 is getting us more, a lot more recognition statewide and even at the national level. So that's something that I think we want to leverage and build on. But we have to be very careful because certain services we can do nationwide, but if it comes to services like therapy, uh, the therapist has to be licensed in the state where the, the client lives. So we can't do telehealth in Florida from California. So, you know, telehealth has also made a big difference. It's given us a lot more flexibility that this counseling crisis counseling center was initially set up as a local Los Angeles center. The building that we have that loan on uh, is our, our suicide prevention center. And when we, when we remodeled that building, part of it was a, a therapy center. And, you know, the expectation seven years ago was that people would come in for therapy. So uh, the population we could reach was limited by the people who could commute in to Los Angeles. Now we can make that a statewide program. And, you know, we've one insurance company we're working with, and I think they feel if the program's successful, they would want to extend it to other states where they have a high membership population. And at that point, we'd have to look at whether we're going to hire licensed therapists in that state. Yeah, that was going to be my next question is the, is the intention to kind of grow outside of California, but it sounds like waiting for, for an insurer to step up. Well, I think that it's a little bit of a chicken and egg situation. I mean, if they come to us and say, this program's working great in California, let's do it in Florida, then we've got to go out and hire the staff to do that. And I think having had a lot of experience now with remote staff and telehealth, it, it's very doable, but it takes time to build up uh, the clientele. Yeah, fair enough. Thank you, Howard, for joining us and sharing your insights into your financial strategies for the year. That's all the time we have for now. This is Sherrod Ross, and we'll see you next time on the Allocator Podcast. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Allocators. Join us next week for a new discussion where we get inside the mind of a financial decision maker. I'm Sherrod Ross. See you next time. Thank you.